I'm um, Mike Woodford from Columbia University. And as Eric had mentioned uh, this morning, I'm also one of the other co-organizers of, um, of the event. And, uh, but I'm looking forward to it um, as much as I hope you all are. I mean, I, I know some of what some of the speakers will be talking about, but I expect um, uh, to, to, learn, to learn quite a lot um, myself. As, um, as you know, the general theme of the summer school is about imprecision in cognition and what, um, uh, what we can bring to economic analysis from trying to introduce imprecision of various types into economic models. That's going to mean various things, as, as you'll see as the, as the school progresses. But one of those themes um, I want to uh, start talking about today, and that's the idea that I think it's important to introduce uh, noise into models of decision-making processes, and the idea that in the process through which a decision-maker confronted with their situation decides what to do, that there is random noise at, at, various, um, at various stages in the decision process. And in this first lecture, I'm going to talk in relatively general terms about what we might mean by that and, and talk broadly about some different ways of, uh, of introducing noise into decision processes and hope to convince you that uh, interesting things can come out of, um, out of doing that. Uh, to start with, if you ask, you know, why would one think about there being noise at all in decision processes, the most, um, the most basic observation um, is that we want to motivate apparent random variability in, in choices that are made. And the thing I want to point out first is why uh, that is on, it on its face somewhat surprising, at least to people who have taken a lot of economics classes. Um, and the reason is that um, standard rational choice theory uh, would, it, for many classes of particularly individual decision problems, imply that a decision maker's choice should be some perfectly predictable function of the characteristics of the choice options. And so if they're, say, choosing between gambles, there should be some probability distribution of different possible returns um, from one kind of financial investment, say, or another, and that if you know the description of all of those characteristics, say the complete distribution of possible returns on the different assets, there should, in fact, be a choice function which tells you uh, what the given decision maker will do in each choice situation, which is it should be completely predictable that they'll choose the option that ranks highest on their preference ordering from any given choice set. Uh, if their preferences are specified by a utility function, it would be, uh, or if they're, say, expected utility maximizers, it should be the option that implies the highest expected utility. But the approach uh, doesn't have to be as specific as expected utility maximization. There should be some kind of well-defined preference ordering over whatever the domain is. And you should expect then that if you've completely described the characteristics of the options presented to the decision maker, it should be predictable as a function of those data uh, what they would choose in a given decision problem. Now, if you ask, well, is it that obvious that that isn't right, uh, it, it's not so easy in the case of uh, natural decisions, decisions you observe important economic decisions that are taken uh, in the world um, because it's hard for us as economic analysts to be sure we know exactly what all the characteristics, what all the relevant characteristics are of the options uh, presented to a decision maker. In particular, we may not be sure exactly which aspects of those characteristics are or are not visible to the decision maker at the time that they're, um, that they're making a decision. And so we might, even if it, there appears to be randomness to us, we might think that's only because we are not observing exactly what the characteristics are that are observable to the decision maker and are actually influencing their decision. But we can, um, we can more precisely test this idea in the case of laboratory experiments, where we present 
a decision maker with options where we can uh, be quite sure that we know exactly what we've told them. And so if they're, um, say, gambles, we can know exactly what we've told them the possible payoffs are. We can know exactly what we told them the probabilities of different outcomes are. Uh, these are stated by the experimenter. Usually one takes some pains to be sure that you're saying things clearly and some training even in the format you're going to use to try to make sure that on each trial the experimental subject should be able to understand what you're presenting them with in the way you want them to understand it. And even in these um, relatively artificial, uh, very controlled settings, it does seem that experimental subjects' choices look as though they're random as functions of the uh, characteristics of the choice options that have been described to the subject. That doesn't mean that we're talking about people who seem simply not to listen to what they've been told. What one often observes is it seems that choice is probabilistic, but with the probabilities being the thing that vary systematically with the characteristics um, of the choice options. So as I, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think that's a good question, and I won't, you know, I, I won't say that I'll have resolved it. I will give examples of um, random-looking behavior where at least the nature of the behavior seems pretty regular and can be explained by relatively simple models if one postulates that there are models where there is genuine randomness. Now, that's not going to be a proof that some complicated model isn't also able to explain what was really happening in the data, um, which I, you know, I agree. I agree I'm not, going to, I'm not going to present evidence on that, but this is at least a simple example of the kind of thing I'm talking about that looks a lot like there is randomness, but again, that doesn't mean something that can't be modeled by a fairly simple uh, mathematical model. This is a, a classic um, experimental study in choice under risk um, uh, by Mosteller and Noji, published in the Journal of Political Economy back in 1951, one of the earliest experimental papers um, in an economics journal. And it was one of the early attempts to test the von Neumann Morgenstern theory of choice under risk. And so, what Mosteller and Noji wanted to do was to ask whether um, one could experimentally test the consistency of people's choices with some von Neumann Morgenstern utility function. And so they wanted to have experiment, their experimental subjects make choices between gambles and see if from having a given subject make choices about a bunch of different gambles, they could back out what kind of von Neumann Morgenstern utility function was consistent with that person's choices. This is a figure from their paper illustrating how they were using the raw data to extract something that they wanted a hypothesized von Neumann Morgenstern utility function to be consistent with. What's being shown in the figure is one experimental subject's choices in a set of decision problems over the course of an experimental session where the decision problems that are being plotted here all had the same form. So there were a bunch of simple decisions, but in each case the form of the problem is the subject is told they have an option of paying five cents if they want to take a gamble. They have to pay five cents to take the gamble. If they take the gamble, they will get an amount X with a probability of one half, and with probability one half, they'll get nothing. The amount X is different on different trials, and that's what's being plotted on the horizontal axis. Is these are the different possible values of X. And on the vertical axis is indicating what fraction of the time the subject takes the offer when x has a particular value. And so you see that the values used were sometimes 7 cents, 9 cents, 10 cents, 11 cents, 12 cents, um, and 16 cents. And um, 
what the what you see is this probability of taking or fraction of time that the offer is taking is a monotonically increasing function of x, um, which I think one would expect. I mean, one would hope that that was true. Um, that indicates the subject is not simply ignoring what they're being told about the gamble. The more favorable the gamble is, the um, the greater the likelihood that the subject does take it. And what Mostella and Noji are interested in doing is carefully plotting that relationship, interpolating between these points, the values of x that they tried, and um, figuring out where an indifference point is, which they define as how big x has to be to get the subject to take the gamble exactly as often as they don't take it. And so you see there how they interpolate between the different values of x, ask what x would have to be to get you to exactly 50% of the time the offer being taken. They call that the indifference point. That's what they want this subject's von neumann morgenstern utility function then to explain. And so the point of the figure was to explain how they calculate that indifference point that they want then the theory to, um, to explain. What I want to point out, though, about the figure is that it's not a figure that was consistent with the theory, the theory of choice under risk that they were intending to experimentally test because the von neumann morgenstern theory would say there should be an indifference point. You should be able to figure out what x has to be if, if you know the von neumann morgenstern utility function for a subject. And what you should observe is that they should never take the gamble when x is below that value and always take the gamble when x is above it. And so you should see a discontinuous jump from 0% of the time to 100% of the time at some point. And we don't see that. Instead, there are a bunch of values for which sometimes they take the gamble and sometimes they don't, even though on these different trials they're being presented with exactly um, uh, the same choice, and they're doing different things. Now, of course, Eric's question is relevant here because when I say they're presented with exactly the same choice, but they do different things, I'm presuming something about how they understand the situation, namely that these are independent choices and there's no connection between the payoffs they're getting from one of them and what um, their payoff could have been on some other decisions that they've just made. And of course, now I'm making an assumption that I can't test. The experimenters thought that was the problem they wanted to present. They tried to come up with an experimental design that was intended to be understood that way, but there's certainly a question possible about what the, um, what the subjects are doing. But if you understand it that way, at least it seems that you've asked exactly the same question repeatedly. Most of these uh, gambles that are shown in the figure, the su same subject saw that same gamble 14 different times during this same session. And so when it was 10 cents, um, they are taking it, um, uh, I believe they're taking it four times and not taking it 10 times. And you know, so it, it's clear that there's, you know, they're sometimes doing one thing and, and, and sometimes doing another. OK, so how can we understand that? Well, there, by now, I mean, this is a very familiar observation about experimental data in laboratory experiments. And there's a common interpretation that's given to it, which is to suppose um, a, a very popular kind of model assumes that there are underlying preferences. There is some well-defined valuation for each of the possible options for a given decision maker, that this valuation is a function um, only of the features of the choice option. So if it's a gamble, just a function of the payoffs and their probabilities, and that that valuation function is for the given subject indeed invariant across different contexts in which they might be presented with that gamble. But the uh, extension of the theory to make it introduce randomness is to assume that instead of the subject necessarily choosing the option that has the highest value according to their preferences, that the probability of choosing a given option uh, depends on how much greater the value to them of that option is relative to the alternatives on, um, on, on that occasion. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think one knows, um, at least I don't know from, you know from what was reported in that paper, and this is um, 
this is you know a a relatively short session so i guess i don't know you know if the same person kept solving problems of this kind um what they would do i've i've done some experiments of this kind where we did look at say the first half versus the second half of the experiment and and don't find big evidence of learning effects of that kind at least over over the span of the experiment, but again, the experiments are relatively short because um, you know on limits on how long we can keep a given uh, a given undergraduate in 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 the laboratory. Um, um, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yes, so so it, so it's also true there that it's not the case that if you ask the subject a given question, they always give the same answer um, to that question. I think it's a more dramatic. I mean, the puzzle. I mean, for economic theory, I think is more dramatic in the case of the gambles that are described to the subject because there you have more reason to think that you know exactly what they know and what is the basis for their decision and you think you know all the information that you think should be relevant and you know what you told them. In the case of these choices from experience, um, there's at least the question of whether you know what the previous experience is that they might be drawing on and so um, Well, I, I mean, I think that there are many things that are similar about them. It's just that the decision, I think the decisions from experience introduce additional issues that are, I would think of as additional complications because then you obviously have to recall previous experiences and so then there's the question of, there's another source of imprecision um, and in, I think also another obvious source of, of noise um, in that those processes of, of recall are themselves uh, demonstrably imprecise and I think also involve randomness that this given person is not going to call to mind exactly the same things in response to a given uh, decision prompt on each occasion but that's an additional complication that's not present in, in the kind of experiment that I'm showing you here just so anyway I wanted to point out this idea of interpreting what's going on as there's a probability of choosing and the probability of choosing is responding specifically to the differences in values of the alternatives is uh, something that explains, for example, what Mosteller and Noji were doing in that picture. So they were in fact assuming that what they were interested in was finding an indifference point and the von neumann morgenstern theory should explain uh, why a particular lottery is the one that you're indifferent between that and five cents um, with certainty under the interpretation that these probabilities are telling you about the difference in values then you would conclude that uh, in the case of ten cents the fact that you uh, you turn down the gamble more often than you take it is interpreted as meaning that the difference in values favors the certainty over the gamble. The fact that you take it more than 50% of the time when x is equal to 11 cents means that the difference in values favors the, um, uh, the, the random choice over the certain amount. And if you could find that point where you're equally likely to take it and not take it, then that's going to be the case where the values are inferred, um, are inferred to be the same. Yeah. Well, so, so at least that, that's not what was going on in the experiment. Now, again, there's, of course, there's this question that, you know, that Eric was raising about what the subject might think um, the environment is. But, I mean, the experimenters were not in real time changing the gambles they presented based on a conjecture about what they're learning the person's utility function is. And I, 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 doubt, I doubt that the subjects knew it for sure. I mean, so they, they 
they, they might perhaps. I mean, they certainly, they certainly were not being get, given a reason to think that because they didn't, you know, they didn't, they were not doing that. They were not thinking about that. They didn't talk about the experiment that way, but of course, uh, y you could have many conjectures about what's going on. So anyway, this general class of models that I'm referring to that involve comparison noise have the general form that the hypothesis is there's a probability of choosing one option over the other one that's a predictable function of the difference in the values, say the expected utilities assigned to those two options, uh, typically assumed to be some kind of sigmoid function like this, uh, with the probability of one half being associated with zero value difference and increasing values above one half when the value difference is positive. Uh, values correspondingly less than one half when the value difference is negative. One commonly used functional form is this logistic function down there with then one free parameter to, um, to estimate on your data. That isn't the for only form that's used in the literature, but that's an extremely common one. Uh, there's a variety of models of what's going on, characterizations of stochastic choice that can all lead to that kind of um, general theory and indeed can all justify the use of that exact logistic function under at least some circumstances. And I'm not going to go through them all in uh, detail. Tomasz tomorrow is going to be talking a lot about models like this and will explain to you more of how some at least of these, um, of these models work. One that's very well known is uh, additive random utility models where you say instead of there's a utility associated with A and a utility associated with B, and you always take A if the utility of A is bigger than the utility of B. You assume that there's a utility of A and a utility of B, and then you add a random term to each of those. You draw randomly from the same distribution, regardless of what the true characteristics of the option are. So the probability of, ch and then you take the thing that has the higher value once you've added the random term. So then the probability of choosing A instead of B is the probability of drawing two random terms such that the difference of the two random terms is bigger than the threshold determined by the difference in UA minus UB. And so you get a, uh, a probability of that happening that comes from the cumulative distribution function of the difference between the two random terms. Okay, so one has various theories that can lead to that kind of prediction, but I want to uh, point out, the point of this lecture is actually to point out that that's not the only um, kind of cognitive noise that we might want to introduce and, um, and that might be explaining things like what you see in that experiment. So models of the kind on the previous slide could be viewed as ones where the noise in the decision process is comparison noise. So one can think of it as noise that's only entering at the end of a choice process, that the subject is presented with options, they're presented with data that define the characteristics of the options, the subject is able to accurately compute these values, that UA and UB, um, as a function of what they've been told about the choice options, and all of that's occurring uh, perfectly accurately, and it's only at the stage where you decide, okay, now that you know UA and UB, which one do you want, there's noise in that process of comparison. Instead of saying that you necessarily pick then the one that's higher, there's going to be randomness in that process of deciding which one seems to be higher. Um, well, not necessarily, but um, what I want to point out today is that, that assuming that that's necessarily where the randomness is is also not the only um, the option. On the question of why there's randomness, Rava is going to, I hope, uh, illuminate us a lot about the nature of noise in the nervous system, and so that'll be one answer to where randomness might um, might come in, but it's not obvious that specifically comparison noise is the only plausible place for randomness to come in. And I, at least I, I want, in fact, to make you wonder whether that's really right in this lecture. So the alternative I want to talk about um, in this lecture is the idea that perhaps instead it's these features that are defining the options that the experimenter tells you this is the amount that you'll get if the gamble pays off or they tell you this is the probability that the gamble will pay that positive amount or things like that 
uh, that these data that you're being told and that define the options are themselves in some way corrupted by noise before they can be integrated into then computing the value to you of the choice options. And um, so then that could also result in randomness of the subject's choice, conditioning on the objective features, which is what the experimenter knows about the choice options. And that would be true. You would observe random choice even if the subject's choice process is, in fact, perfectly optimal in all the later stages. So once the data that they've been presented with are somehow being uh, recorded or retrieved, uh, with noise, one could suppose that all of the subsequent um, steps in the decision process are perfectly optimal, conditional on the decision process having to be based on these noisy representations of, of what the subject was told. So it might be that they're estimating the values based on the noisy representations of the data optimally, and that they are indeed choosing the thing that according to their optimal estimates um, are on average likely to have the higher expected value, and it's this noise at an earlier stage in the process that has um, that's resulted in the randomness of the choice. Now you might ask, well, why would I come up with that as a thing that is um, has any plausibility as a source of of noise in decision processes? And one reason, and indeed it's what got me thinking a, a lot about this, is the fact that in the case of perceptual judgments, there's a very long-standing literature in experimental psychology going back to the middle of the 19th century, um, which documents randomness in perceptual comparisons and where the standard interpretation is that it's in the early stages of, of processing of uh, features of the sensory environment um, that are assumed to be random and that the judgments then about which thing is heavier, which thing is larger than another, and so on, are being based on random information available to the brain about, um, about the environment. And if you ask why, do, why is that hypothesis so popular in um, psychology and neuroscience, in the case of sensory features, we know a lot about relatively early stages of processing of, of sensory information, and one can demonstrate that there is randomness in the firing of the particular neurons in parts of the brain that are involved in processing particular types of sensory information. Again, I, I'm hoping Rava is going to uh, supply more detail on this, but not only can one show that the firing of the neurons in response to a particular environmental condition appears to be random, but at least in some cases there are interesting studies that have been sh that show that you can explain a lot of the difference in the degree of randomness of perceptual comparisons in the case of different stimuli from the degree of randomness of these early stages of processing of those different stimuli. And so at least in that particular area, it seems that a lot can be explained by randomness in this early stage of processing of the information, perhaps under a hypothesis of optimal processing later. And in fact, in the literature on sensory perception, um, there's an extensive literature which does try to explain, theoretically, the nature of uh, both errors and biases in sensory judgments on the assumption that those judgments are optimal conditional on the noisy sensory data um, that, that are the start of the process. So a question about this before proceeding further is, well, you might say, okay, that's a maybe a very plausible interpretation in the case of perceptual comparisons, and you might think, but it's not at all plausible to think that subjects' decisions in things like the Mosteller and Noji experiment are anything like those perceptual comparisons. And, and the reason is, you know, you might say, yes, if someone is having to s tell me uh, which of two weights, which one is heavier than the other, they're holding them each in their two hands, uh, they only learn about that from, um, you know, what the feeling of their muscles as they hold these things in their hands, and you can say, okay, I believe there's random error in these sensory receptors, what they're sending up to the brain about uh, how it feels to hold things, or sensory receptors in the retina when you're looking at visual stimuli and so on. I, I believe there's um, noise in that process. 
Uh, but you might say, in the case of the Mosteller and Noji experiment, you're learning about the size of the payoff, or you're learning about probabilities of, of the gamble paying off, and you're, the subjects are being told this symbolically. They're being told it with number symbols, and um, you might say that the, then precise recognition of what these amounts are should be possible, and indeed that's probably why we've invented number symbols, that it lets us communicate with each other very precisely about uh, numerical magnitudes. I don't have to tell you it's sort of like something this size, that's what I'm going to pay you. And um, I, I tell you with a number and you think then, then, then we know, we can bargain and we know what we're both talking about. And uh, so you, you might think that, but the answer is um, there is interesting evidence in, in the psychology literature that even when numbers are presented to people um, through symbols, that the presentation of the number symbol activates an internal representation in the brain of this quantity, which is in fact imprecise in a very similar way as in the uh, the imprecision of, of sensory magnitudes. And so this is what's sometimes called a semantic representation in the brain of, of the numerical amount. And it seems that this semantic representation is something that allows people to make judgments about approximately how big numbers are, which is different from uh, explicit reasoning about exact um, um, numerical quantities. When do we re lie on this approximate sense of how large numbers are. I mean, one example is when very rapid judgments about the size of numbers has to be made. And I'm going to show you uh, on the next slide some data of that kind. Um, but it's not just something that's involved when you have to make a very rapid judgment. In the case of being told numbers but then having to recall them later in time, it seems that people uh, recall the magnitudes of the numbers in an imprecise way using this symbolic representation. So this study by Dehane and Marcus that I refer to on the slide uh, is an experiment where they told people the prices of particular items and then they later asked them to recall what uh, how much those things cost, and what they find is, of course, errors in the prices that people recall, but the errors um, are errors suggestive of them having a semantic memory of how large a quantity they were told as, the, uh, um, as opposed to remembering visually what the number looked like or something of that kind. It was, um, so it seems that the symbol was translated into a sense of it being a large or small quantity, which is then retrieved imprecisely. There are interesting experiments that involve patients with brain injuries who lose their ability to remember arithmetic facts. So, you know, you ask them what's three plus four, and they've forgotten that. You know, the part of the brain where they used to store uh, those learned precise uh, things. Um, isn't there, but they can say things about how big it is. You know, they can say, well, kind of around six, probably, sort of like six, right? I mean, you ask them, don't you think it's 12? And they say, no, 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 come on, it, it's, it, it's, it's not, definitely not as big as 12. They, they cannot remember the fact that they learned in school three plus four equals seven, but they have a sense of how big is a three and how big is a four, and so they can have an approximate sense of what the answer is. Okay, so this is an example. I want to present um, a little bit of the data from one of these cases just because um, I'll also then talk about a more recent study, which is an extension of this. So it's maybe worth knowing this old study by Dehane and his co-authors from 1990. This is an experiment where the subjects are shown a two-digit numeral. And they have to say whether it's bigger or smaller than 65. And so there are two keys on a keyboard. Uh, they have to push one key or the other, one key if they think it's larger, one key if they think it's smaller. And they have to do this quickly. So the point of the experiment is, is to see how quickly they can say whether the number is larger or smaller than 65. And what they find is that when the number presented is near 65, there are more errors in saying whether it's bigger or smaller than 65, also slower responses. If the number is further from 65 in either direction, they make uh, fewer errors and they also give faster responses. And, and on the question of why the response time is relevant, in the errors, you can say, well, if you imagine there's a semantic representation of the number that they can call to mind very quickly when they see the number and they have to base their quick answer on that, um, you might think that if it's imprecise, then when the number is 
around 65, they make more mistakes in saying whether it's bigger than 65 um, or not. Response time is relevant if you imagine that your model of the noisy representation is not just that one noisy representation is immediately called to mind, but there's a, there's a process in which a succession of random uh, readings of what the number means uh, can occur, and you could draw more of those random samples or fewer of them depending on how precise an answer to the question you've already gotten from the first few samples. Again, I think Tomas is going to talk a lot about um, models of decisions based on a sequence of noisy readings of the situation. But what I'm going to point out is that in that literature, um, you can motivate it as, in fact, being an optimal way of responding to making decisions on the basis of a noisy sequence of information like that to both have a decision rule that draws more samples before deciding when the individual samples um, are relatively ambiguous as well as making more mistakes even after you uh, decide that you're ready to say. I'm going to show you. Yeah, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you data. I'm going to show you the data. OK, so this is, this is a figure from their paper. Um, so that's right. Well, that's right. But what you see here is that it, it's not just whether you can answer it from the first digit that's, a, that's, you know, that's determining the answer. Because if you look in the 60s, for example, um, people are getting it right, are making, uh, in particular, it's clearest from the response time. People answer fastest, or sorry, answer slowest when it's 64. Um, and they're faster when it's 60 or 61, or when it's 68 or 69. Although those are all cases where the first digit doesn't answer it, and then you have to look at the second digit. But it seems that what the second digit is, and whether it's close to 5 or further away from 5, is affecting um, how quickly they can answer. Similarly, when you go out of things that start with 6, it's not that, um, that you see a big discontinuous jump between how quickly you can answer when it's uh, 60 versus 59. I mean, there's a little bit of difference there. but um, things in the high 50s take you about as long as things in the low 60s take you to give the answer. Things that are in the low 50s instead of the high 50s, uh, people are answering more quickly and they're making fewer mistakes. And so it And, and again, I, and I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not disagreeing with you that the symbolic representation doesn't have any effect on the structure of the errors, because I think it's, I mean, obviously what people have to see is they start by seeing the symbol, right? So under the hypothesis that the structure of error in this semantic representation is important, you still have to suppose that first they see the symbol, and that calls to mind a semantic representation, and then there's the question of how precisely they retrieve the semantic representation. But they have to, there has to be the part about seeing the symbol and calling something to mind when you see the symbol. And so I, I agree with you that the form of the symbol also is likely to be relevant and the thing you're saying that say uh, telling that the 5 is not a 6 is harder than telling that the 7 is not a 6 and I, you know, I think we see some effects of that kind as well but, um, but I think we see also things that don't look like it's just explained by what the number symbol looks like it seems that how big or small the numbers actually are in terms of what they mean is also um, is also having an effect uh, on the pattern of errors. Yes. Um, well, yes, but I, I'm hoping to say some other things still in the talk. But. Uh, I, I I don't, and I don't remember if I don't remember if their paper comments on that or not. 
I think he's talking about the 60s, within the 60s, yeah. At 61, you make more mistakes than with 69. You're, you're, yeah, yeah, at the bottom, yeah, which is the fraction of errors. That's the, the probability of errors is the bottom, and the reaction time is the top. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I, I will. Um, so what I want to spend more time on is asking you whether it matters whether we adopt these, these two alternative interpretations, right? You might say, well, OK, I could imagine uh, a model in which people are, have to base their decision on a noisy retrieval of what the experimenter told me, say what these numerical magnitudes were, and then they reliably make a judgment on the corrupted information. Uh, or I could imagine the alternative, that they correctly recognize what they were told and do early stages of evaluating the value of the gamble based on what they were told, and, and then it's at the end in this comparison process that somehow uh, a lot of random noise comes in. And you might say, it's not obvious why you care if there's anything observationally different about the two hypotheses. And in particular, in a simple case, um, where you imagine you're comparing, you know, say, uh, you know, two things where you're directly told what the value of the two options are. You might say it's it's uh, it seems like it's the same if I say I have a noisy reading of the value you told me um, in the two cases, and then I perfectly compare my noisy readings to each other, or I correctly recognize the values, but then I do a noisy comparison process between the two things. Um, th this may seem like these are going to be equivalent theories in terms of what they predict, and so why would I waste your time even telling you that there are two different possible ways of thinking about it? So I want to talk about some reasons why the hypothesis of early noise, even with then optimal decision making on the basis of the noisy data can have different implications than the model of precise recognition of the characteristics of the options, but then comparison noise coming later. So one reason why you can get new phenomena from the hypothesis of early noise is that um, you can have biases in the estimation of individual features of a choice option that result from noisy encoding of those features or noisy retrieval of what those features are for use in constructing your estimate of overall value. And because of those biases that result from possibly optimal inference from the noisy reading of the features, this can result in an overall est an estimate of the overall value of the option that's not just a function of the true overall value. So under the first kind of theory, there was a well-defined value of all those features, and it should always be that same uh, combination of the features to form the, the overall value estimate that is the determinant of the probability of choosing in each case. And instead, one can end up having uh, the probabilities of choice depend on the features in some more complicated way. Uh, not the one that's involved in the, uh, the computation of the true value. To make that uh, more concrete, if one supposes that you have a decision rule that's been adapted to maximize the decision maker's average financial reward from their decisions, which you might think is the right objective for a decision maker if you're talking about very small gambles, because you might say, well, as long as the gambles are all small, uh, the margin of utility of additional money should be essentially the same across all the outcomes, and it should be then the expected value of the gamble that's actually relevant to the decision maker. And we might think that optimal decision making should mean a decision rule which has been adapted to a class of decision problems to actually maximize their average financial reward. In a theory with that form, 
it doesn't have to turn out that, say, the amount people are willing to bid to get the outcome of a given gamble is just going to be a function of the expected value. It could be a function of the data of, of, of some more complex form, as I, as I want to talk about. Okay, so to give an example of that, um, suppose that there's a lottery, it offers a monetary payoff of some size x with some probability p, and, and you get zero otherwise. So that's the kind of gambles that were involved in the Mostella and Noji experiment. Suppose now that the decision problem is that the decision maker is going to be asked what price they would bid to receive the outcome of the lottery. So in this kind of experiment, we're going to elicit a certainty equivalent value for the lottery. Um, from the decision maker. So a given decision problem is specified by two quantities, P and X, that the subject is, is going to be told. So under the hypothesis that I want to talk about, each of those two quantities will be imprecisely encoded in the, in the mind of the subject. So there'll be an internal representation R sub P, which is representing what they were told about the probability P, an internal representation R sub X, which is encoding what they were told about the monetary payoff x, I'm going to suppose that each of those things is a draw from some probability distribution where the distribution of RPs depends on what the true value P was and similarly with the, with the Rx. And then our hypothesis is that the decision maker's bid is going to have to be some function. There'll be a decision rule that will be a function of that internal representation, meaning it'll be a function of the RP and the Rx. Uh, okay, what should the decision maker be trying to maximize? Uh, in the experiments that, I, that I've done with Mel Ka and Zhang Li, um, there's a BDM auction at the end of the experiment. One of these um, cases in which they supplied evaluation is selected as being the one that will determine their payoff from the experiment, and they're bidding against a, ran a computerized random bidder. There's a second price auction in which they're bidding against the computer. The bids of the computer are unrelated to the characteristics of the gamble, and they're uniformly distributed over an interval. The true expected value of the lottery is always in that, um, in that interval. In the case of that setup, and we also explain to the subjects that they will in fact maximize their uh, financial reward on average from the experiment if they bid uh, their subjective estimate of, um, of, of, the, uh, of the value of the gamble to them. In fact, their optimal bid should be the conditional expectation of P times X conditioning on these random values RP and RX, which are the, the random, the noisy internal representations of the characteristics of the lottery. If the subject is doing that, conditional on the true characteristics P and X, the RP and RX are random. B will be some deterministic function of RP and RX, but it will be random conditional on the true characteristics P and X. And so we'll, one will observe a probability distribution um, of bids. But the thing I wanted to point out is that um, the distribution of bids conditional on P and X is not in general under this kind of theory going to just be a function of the product P times X. So two different lotteries with the same expected value, one with a higher monetary payoff but with a lower probability, another one with a lower monetary payoff but with a higher probability, will not result in the same, um, in general, not result in the same distribution of bids. Um, I think for reasons of time, I probably won't uh, talk, talk too much about the, um, uh, the algebra of how you would work that out, but you can, um, you can show that under the kind of theory I've just proposed, the average bid conditional on P and X is going to turn out to be a product of some function, a nonlinear function of P and a nonlinear function of X. What determines those nonlinear functions is, um, is indicated uh, down at the bottom of the slide. So it's going to depend on the joint, on the one hand, the joint distribution of P and the internal representation of P. The other function is going to depend on the joint distribution of the X's and the internal representation of the X's. But um, under uh, under most circumstances, the nature of those two functions is going to be such that the product of the one function of P and the other function of X is not going to be any function 
of, uh, of, of p times x. And that can be an interpretation then of uh, distortions. I, I chose my notation here to make it look like prospect theory if, um, uh, if people are familiar with that. This can be an interpretation of where things that look like uh, biases in choice are coming from, even though the theory is one in which the decision rules um, of the subject are, in this case, maximizing the expected financial reward that they're getting uh, from what they're choosing. Yes? Why is the risk aversion possibly playing a role here? Uh, well, uh, the hypothesis in, in this case is that the subject has adapted, in fact, something that's good for them because it's going to maximize the expected money they get. And if you ask why is that relevant, it's because these are small amounts, like in the Mostella and Noji experiment, where you're, you could lose five cents, you could gain 12 cents. Um, that if you integrate that with the rest of your wealth, that should not be making, uh, you know, you're right, that, that the margin utility of, of, of additional money should be essentially constant over the range that's involved in the experiment. Okay, but a second, an, another possible reason, apart from that, for interest in, the, in this uh, alternative approach is that the noisy coding theory um, implies that you could have manipulations of the decision situation that should change the degree of coding precision. And if you can do that, if there are ways to manipulate the degree of uh, precision of the subject's encoding of the data, then that should be able to change the degree of estimation bias um, showing up in apparent biases in the subject's choice. So how might you think you could vary the precision of the encoding? Uh, one way might be by varying time pressure. I just referred earlier to the idea that perhaps the internal representation is something that's built up through a sequence of noisy readings, and that the internal evidence is, in fact, the cumulative evidence from a sequence of noisy readings. If you have a model like that, forcing a decision more quickly would mean it has to be based on a smaller number of those noisy internal readings, and so there'll be more noise in that internal representation. Um, so then Bayesian decoding, optimal decoding of the noisy evidence um, should result in the case of greater time pressure, not just in more random variability of the subject's estimate of the values, but it can result in larger average biases in their valuations. In the case where the optimal estimate based on the noisy information is biased relative on average relative to the, um, uh, the true valuations. Uh, I have an experimental paper with, uh, with, with Rafa Polanya um, and others um, in which we um, look at the effect of time pressure on subjects' ratings of food items and, um, and find that the, uh, the subjects don't even on average uh, express the same valuation of a, the same food item when they have to make the faster judgment and when we give them a longer decision time. And, uh, and we show in that paper that the, ch the change in which things are um, valued more or valued less um, in, in the case of increased time pressure is consistent with a model of optimal Bayesian decoding of the noisy internal representation of the item's values, where the, uh, the model, the noisy coding is the same. It's just that you make a larger number of the noisy readings or a smaller number of the noisy readings in the two cases, and you're optimally decoding in both of those cases. Uh, perhaps, that's right. Uh, there, there is, it's not just fast food, but it, you know, if you notice when you go to a lot of stores, the most kind of stores I go to, there, there are certain food items they like to put in the checkout lane, hoping that you, know, you won't have thought about it, but while you're standing there waiting to get to pay, um, you're going to make a fast decision. And they, they seem to think there are certain items that they'll sell more of if they put them there. And I think that, that suggests that there are... There, Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, okay. There are other ways, though, of trying to manipulate the encoding noise that could uh, influence valuation biases. And, and a particularly interesting one, I want to mention Ben Anke and Thomas Graber have a recent paper, which is also about valuing simple lotteries. So they elicit certainty equivalent values for simple lotteries. Um, and what they want to look at is the bias in the valuation of the lottery. 
Specifically, they look at the ratio of the certainty equivalent to the monetary payoff, x, that you could get, and ask how that ratio is different from p, the probability that the subject was told. So if the certainty equivalent were, in fact, the expected value, that ratio should be the probability of, of getting the non-zero amount x. They look at how, uh, whether on average it's the higher or lower than P. And what they find is the ratio of the certain equivalent to the monetary payoff is bigger than P in the case of small P's, but uh, smaller than P on average in the case of larger P's. And that's true both with when X is a gain, a random gain, or when X is a random loss. That's consistent with Tversky and Kahneman's uh, fourfold pattern of uh, risk attitudes. We could interpret those biases, and I'll talk more about this in my second lecture, you could interpret those biases as a result of optimal Bayesian decoding of a noisy internal representation of that information about the probability of payoff of the lottery that the subject was given. And the basic idea is the subject has a noisy reading of what the value of P is. They're estimating what P uh, is likely to be based on this noisy retrieved representation and that's going to bias their estimate of the probability of the lottery paying off toward the prior mean. In the experiment, the distribution of true values of P is symmetric around 50%. Um, so being biased toward the prior mean should be being, being biased toward 0.5, which means overestimating, overestimation when P is small and underestimation when P is large. So that could explain the pattern of biases. The thing I want to mention here that's particularly interesting. One of the interesting things in their paper is Anki and Graeber proposed to manipulate the degree of noise in the internal representation by presenting the information about the payoff probability in different ways. Um, and they compare a case where you just tell the subject, say it's 70% probability it pays off, you tell them the number 70% with a case where, in fact, they describe the lottery as a compound lottery. So they give them the information that you're going to draw a value, and then that's going to determine uh, the probability with which a second lottery will determine whether it pays off or not. And the compound lottery is equivalent to the simple lottery. So they can tell them the same information, and you do the arithmetic, do the mental arithmetic, and you know it's an equivalent problem. You have a 70% chance of getting x and a 30% chance of getting 0. But what they hypothesize is that when they present the information in the compound form, there will be more noise in the internal representation of how big that magnitude is. And they show that increasing the noise in the internal representation, in fact, increases this bias that I was referring to. And so this is what their data look like. They're presenting here on the vertical axis the ratio of the certainty equivalent to the value x. That's what they're calling the normalized certainty equivalent. The upper half of the panel is when x is a random gain. The bottom half of the panel is when x is a random loss. And the dashed lines are the case where the ratio of the certain equivalent to x is equal to the probability p. Probability p is on the horizontal axis. And so risk, perfect risk neutral choice, you would always be on the dashed lines, both with the random gains and with the random losses. What you see is when the probabilities p are low, you're overvaluing the random gains. Uh, you're, you're, um, um, exaggerating similarly how negative the random losses are. When P is large, uh, the biases are in the opposite direction. Okay, so that's explaining uh, the fourfold pattern of, of risk attitudes. The interesting thing here is that comparing the red and blue sets of data, the um, the blue sets of data, low cognitive uncertainty, that's the case where they tell the subject the value of P. They directly tell them 90% probability that this gamble pays off. The red data are from the experimental treatment where they present it in, uh, as a compound lottery, and the subject has to figure out what the equivalent probability is. And what you see in almost all of the cases is that in the case of the red equivalent red lottery, the biases are bigger. It, you move a, the distribution of bids moves further away from the dashed line, whether it's further above it at low probabilities or further below it at high probabilities. So the whole fourfold pattern of risk attitudes, um, in each case, the departures from risk neutrality get increased by increasing the noise of the internal representation. Yes. Yeah, I didn't say it was quite perfect, but it's a, it's a, I think it's a pretty dramatic pattern. Yes. 
I'm going to talk about that in my second lecture. So I'm going to look at stake size effects, but not, not right now. It's coming. Yes, oh, oh, both, for ga both for gains and losses, it's about, yes, it, it's, it's very similar. And I'm going to show you some more data in the second lecture where there's a lot of symmetry, a uh, surprising degree of symmetry between the, the two types of problems. data to be certain that's a regularity? That's, that's an interesting question. Um, OK, let me uh, mention another difference um, between these two types of theories. So the noisy coding hypothesis, unlike the pure hypothesis of comparison noise, uh, can explain another kind of observed phenomenon, which is um, sense another way in which choices seem to be sensitive to the context in which particular options are encountered. And that is that um, one observes more random choice between two particular options, say two different lotteries that, that you're choosing between. The choice is more random when those same options are presented to the subject, but they've been drawn from a wider range of possibilities that have been presented on other trials um, in the experiment. So this is another example of uh, the subject's choices seeming to be sensitive to a prior distribution about what kind of data they're likely to be encountering um, on a given trial. But here, the prior distribution matters not because it's used in interpreting uh, the noisy internal representation you have on a given trial, which is one reason for the prior to be relevant and that I was talking about in uh, the, those previous models of optimal Bayesian uh, decoding of noisy internal representations. But here it also seems that the precision of the encoding itself um, can vary across contexts, evidently varying with the prior distribution that you're expecting, what, what range of values you're expecting to encounter. That kind of sensitivity of the degree of precision of the encoding to the prior distribution that you expect the decision problems to be drawn from is in fact one that can be explained and it would be predicted uh, by what are called theories of efficient coding. This is again something I think Rava is going to talk uh, a good bit more about. It's, it's an, uh, something developed particularly in the uh, neuroscience literature. And so he'll, he'll be telling you a lot more about it, but I want to just mention uh, the basic uh, flavor of such theories. So the Oh, oh, yes, yes. And I, I even have a paper with Elise paisan Lenestour, um in the Journal of Financial Economics. I can send you the reference that shows that, where we, dem we do exactly that manipulation and show that it changes the precision of, um, of discrimination between, um, between two items. But that's not, uh, that's not what... Um, no, 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 no. We, we explain that with efficient code. I'm saying the paper I'm going to talk about right now is not that paper. So this is about the effect of changing the range. I'm going to show you some data on. So the idea is that the, neur the neural system that's producing these internal representations uh, 
by hypothesis, has only some finite capacity to represent different amounts in uh, sufficiently distinguishable ways. Uh, suppose that you have to send this information over a communications channel, and as in Shannon's information theory, the communication channel has only some finite capacity. That uh, in a transmission of a given length, uh, there's only a certain amount of information about what the situation was um, that, that can be transmitted. The efficient coding hypothesis is then the hypothesis that external stimuli are being mapped into this limited variety of possible internal states in a way that's efficient, meaning it's going to make decisions as accurate as possible. So because you can only distinguish a finite uh, number of different situations, you're going to have to accept worse discrimination between some states as the price of allowing sharper discrimination between other states. And it's going to then matter uh, how much it matters to the decision maker to be able to distinguish between um, uh, particular states or not what the efficient way is to encode these different states. Um, that implies then that the optimal encoding scheme should depend on what your prior is over the possible situations that are going to have to be encoded. And an implication of a lot of different versions of efficient coding theories of this kind is something that, uh, that's sometimes called range normalization, which is what I want to talk about here. And that's the idea that the accuracy of discrimination between any two magnitudes should be worse when the two magnitudes are drawn from a prior distribution that has a wider range. So in the case of the wider range, a larger range of objective magnitudes has to be mapped into the same range of possible internal representations. Um, two given magnitudes are going to have to be closer together in psychological space um, when the objective difference between them is a smaller fraction of this overall range of, of possible situations that have to be encoded. And doing that is then going to make encoding noise more significant relative to the degree of difference in the internal representations, then leading to more random errors in judgments. As an illustration of this idea, I want to show you some uh, data from a case where we can actually see um, at least some part of what these internal representations are. So, so far, I've been hypothesizing their, uh, their imprecise internal representations of objective data, but I've just been talking about subjects' choices. Uh, and not the internal representations. This is an, actually an experiment um, uh, by Camilo Pato Esquilpa at Washington University, a, a, a very interesting neuroscientist there. Both of his parents are economists. Uh, is maybe the explanation for why he works on decision-making problems that are interesting to us, uh, although he, uh, he works with monkeys mostly. So this is an experiment with, uh, with, 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 with rhesus macaques. Well, they let, they let you measure their brain more. That's, that's, the, main, that's the main advantage. Uh, he he uh, puts electrodes you know, in very precise locations in the brain and, and uh, measures electrical activity. So what he finds is um, he's presenting the monkeys with choices between different amounts of, of juice of different types. And they learn what the symbols mean, what choice they're being presented with. Um, and now he wants to figure out what is going on in the brain when they make this choice. And he finds um, an internal representation of the value of a particular choice option um, being represented, according to his hypothesis, by the rate of firing of certain cells in the orbitofrontal cortex of this rhesus macaque which he calls offer cells. And he calls them offer cells because his hypothesis is that the rate of firing of the cell is indicating uh, the magnitude of what's being offered, uh, say the number, the quantity of apple juice that's being offered as, as, as one of the choices in the decision problem. And uh, so he, he's interested in finding these cells that are representing the value of that uh, of that choice options. So the firing rate is higher when the quantity of apple juice being offered is higher, and so that's why he calls them offer cells. So the interesting thing now, why I'm showing you this, is that he finds that the firing rate associated with a given quantity of juice is smaller when the range of quantities of juice, say the amount of apple juice that's being offered, is a bigger range on different trials in that experimental session. So here's his data, or this is one of the interesting figures from his paper. There are five different experimental uh, situations here. This is the same monkey. 
Um, but in the, um, the blue curve is a session where it was always either zero, one, or two drops of apple juice. Um, and that's so delta V equals two means the range is only varying between zero and two. Um, the, the yellow experimental situation, they vary between zero and six. The red experimental situation, it varies between zero and 10. And what's being graphed here is the average firing rate in spikes per second on the vertical axis as a function of the number of drops of juice being offered on that trial on the horizontal axis. And so you see the firing rate in each of these cases. The firing rate is an increasing function of what's being offered. And so that's how he concludes that the value of the offer is in fact being represented in the monkey's brain uh, in this particular place. But the interesting thing is this is the same stimuli being presented are affecting the firing rate in different ways depending on what the range of quantities that are presented on different trials are. So what you see is uh, that the firing rate goes from around zero up to more than eight spikes per second um, when you go from zero to two drops of juice in the dark blue uh, experimental setting when you only ever presented zero or one or two. If it's instead the case where the uh, number presented vary between 0 and 10, then the firing rate, when you go from 0 to 2, only goes up from 0 spikes per second to less than 1 spike per second. To get You still can get up to that more than 8 spikes per second, but you have to offer 10 drops of juice now to get the, to get the firing rate to go up that far. So we see dependence on the distribution of uh, of quantities being presented on affecting the nature of this internal representation of what the quantity is. And it's illustrating this range normalization idea. It's as if the quantity is being normalized by the range of values presented on different trials because what we see is that the firing rate never goes outside this range of being between zero and less than nine spikes per second. So it seems that there's a, there's a range of possible things that can be represented. You can represent what's going on by a firing rate that's somewhere between zero and eight point some spikes per second, but you, don't, you can't differentiate the internal representation more than that. So small numbers of additional drops of juice increase the firing rate a lot when you only have to represent a small number of different, um, different quantities of juice and it's a much flatter relationship when you need to be able to represent a larger range of numbers of juice. Yes, yes, yes. So of course we, we can't just tell them uh, do you want three drops of apple juice or four drops of grape juice because Right, they don't, aren't used to talking to us about those things. So there's an extensive, um, and Miguel, who is nodding back here at the break, you should ask Miguel. Miguel is in Camilo's lab, uh, and uh, maybe he will be able to explain to you in detail the nature of the training. Um, but the answer is yes. I mean, th so there has to be an extensive training um, period in which the monkey learns what the setup is that certain symbols that are going to be presented on a screen mean you can have either three drops of apple juice or four drops of grape juice. So you have to first get them to learn that that's what they're being offered. And um, how do you know that they've learned it? The answer is then there starts being consistency in their choice. They're acting and they're responding to being presented with different offers as if they've in fact caught on to what, um, you know, they, that, exactly. So it's, and oh, they're, they, they're smarter, in fact, than the pigeons, but, <laughs> but they, don't, they don't speak our language, and so that's why the, tr the extensive training is necessary, because... Um, the other question is, within each of these treatments, uh, what is the distribution Yes, yes, ye yes, no, that's right. And so I think it's, I think it's uniform um, in this experiment. My paper with Elise is about the thing you're saying. It's about the case where there's uh, something more like a Gaussian distribution, and so then you use more of the representational capacity to distinguish things that are around the mode of the distribution than things that are further out in the tails. And there's also, I think, interesting experimental evidence uh, of that, but that's not what uh, th this particular experiment is illustrating. 
I am going to ask you that in your lecture on 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 neural on on neural representations. Um, I, I will remember to ask that. Yes. Um, so Rava has set us up for something he's going to explain later in the week. Um, <laughs> okay. That that is a topic for your lecture uh, because that that's a that's a neuroscience question. I'm, I, you are much more the expert than me on um, on that. Well, of, of course, there's a, there's a good question about where, you know, how would the subjects come to have a particular prior. In the case of the monkeys that we're referring to, I mean, there, there has been, um, the, the, I mean, the, there, I, there is a, a good bit of training, I mean, involved in that particular experiment. So, I mean. Ah, um, I, I don't think, I don't think, I mean, again, we should ask Miguel if he knows about whether they ever do things like that. But I don't, I don't think, I don't think they try to trick the monkeys. I mean, because, you know, they want, I mean, they want them to be able to learn to understand what the symbols on the screen mean because they need, you know, that's, sort of, that's our only hope of communicating with the monkey about the decision problem we're trying to explain to them. And so I, I think they're not trying to confuse them by having it not mean what they might have come to think. Well, it has to be, in some sense, the perceived range, right? I mean, I mean right? But, but in this experiment, I, the monkey sees many examples. So when you ask, how have they learned the range? Well, they've seen a lot of examples eventually. And so then you know, they, they, they have a basis for knowing. So what the range will be in that session, you mean? Or? I see. So they. No, no, they know, they know the number offered in the trial. The question is, do they know that when I'm offering them two drops, that this is two drops, but on some trials there'll be as many as 10 drops? I mean, oh, how do they know it, though? Uh, and also Visually, that it could be as high as 10, except on this trial it's not 10? I mean, what? But that's about telling them what you're offering them on this trial. Yeah. That's not telling them what the range was of possibilities. But, but I mean, they, from other trials in the session, they would have learned that sometimes it's as high as 10. But I mean, that's a, it's a very good question, how they know the range. But it, I think in this particular experiment, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of experience with you know, things being drawn from this particular range that they would have learned. A more inter it's, it's a better question for the experiment I'm going to tell you about now, which is uh, Carrie Friedman and Lawrence Jean have a recent paper in the Quarterly Journal of Economics where they argue that the same thing seems to be happening for internal representations of numerical quantities uh, in humans. And I want to show you first some, some data from their replication of the Dehane and, uh, and co-authors study that I showed you before. So again, the subjects are being shown a two-digit Arabic numeral. They have to say very quickly whether it's bigger or smaller than 65. The difference here, I mean, they're, you know, they weren't interested in just seeing was Dehane and co-authors right. Can they, can, I mean, sometimes it's interesting just to see if you can replicate famous experiments or not. But their goal was not that. They wanted to have two different treatments where the numbers were being drawn from two different distributions and see if there was a difference in people's accuracy of telling whether quickly whether the number was bigger or smaller than 65. What they find is um, that there are, um, as before, more res mistakes and slower responses when the number's closer to 65. But the new finding is that the responses are slower um, and have more mistakes for a given number, say it's 61, they respond more slowly and, uh, and make more mistakes when the numbers are being drawn from a wider range, even though it's the same number that's presented to the subjects in the two treatments. So this is what their data look like. The left panel is now showing you the, uh, uh, the probability of saying that it's above 65. So that's letting you look at how accurate the responses are. The right panel is showing you average response time again. Uh, the red data are the low volatility distribution. The numbers are only varying between 55 and 75. 
and uh, the high volatility case numbers are varying between 31 and 99 instead. But if you look at the numbers between 55 and 75 that occur in, under both treatments, you see that, um, you know, say numbers like 61, 62, 63, uh, people are making more mistakes in the high volatility treatment than in the low volatility treatment. Uh, and you see that. And also, when you look at how long it takes them to decide, they are giving much slower answers on average in the high volatility treatment than in, than in the low volatility treatment. So this is saying not just that there seems to be a noisy semantic representation of what the number symbol means that's being drawn on, but it seems to be a noisier semantic representation in the treatment where they have to be able to represent a much wider range of numbers than in the case where the numbers are always uh, always occurring between uh, 55 and 75. Yeah. Okay, but, but that's not entirely different from their interpretation. So, I mean, you know, that, that sounds to me like a theory that says there is a more precise internal representation of a number when it's a, you only have to learn how to recognize a smaller range of different numbers. You're calling it a learning effect. They're saying, well, we're having to, we have a certain range of possible internal representations and we have to use them for a bigger range of numbers in one case or the other. But both of these explanations are saying that when you only have to represent a smaller range of numbers, you can, in fact, tell them more accurately apart from each other. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's certainly a, a good question. I don't, I don't remember that they report um, um, data on it. Um, in any event, what I want to... Sh yeah, what? Uh, again, I don't, I, don't, I, don't think that, I don't think they comment on it. Yes. So I, I don't think they comment on it. But what I want to point out that sort of also from, from their paper is that then if you think that the precision of the internal semantic representations of numerical magnitudes has a greater error in the case that a larger range of numbers has to be represented, you might think that should have consequences now for our model of noisy choice between lotteries. So if a monetary payoff in a lottery is going to have an internal representation, uh, which is drawn from a distribution that depends on the true value, we can introduce this range normalization by supposing that the Rx, the internal representation of the payoff x, is drawn from a distribution which depends on, now, not on x, but on an m of x, the probability distribution of internal representations conditional on some um, encoding of x this quantity m, I'm going to assume, is the same across the different um, experimental treatments. But now the hypothesis would be that this mapping of x values into m of x values is going to be different depending on what range of values of x have to be represented. And so the idea is that the m quantity um, can only vary over some bounded range. And that determines a distribution of internal representations when x's that have to be encoded vary over a bigger range, then the m of x function is going to have to map uh, more, more you know, values of x that differ more from each other into closer values of m, um, and therefore more overlapping distributions of, of, of internal representations. In any event, that's a hypothesis they explore. And the consequence you would get from that is the prediction that if you have a larger range of variation in the monetary payoff on the risky lottery, also a larger range of variation in the certain amount that you can have instead, that that should result in noisier choice uh, between the lotteries. And they show in their data that that's what happens. Yes? Can you use these examples to modify something which is called efficient coding? Mm -hmm. Uh, 
I'm again assuming that Rava is going to tell you more about about those um, about those theories. But you know what? I mean, efficiency under their hypothesis, um, or under the, at least the hypothesis I was proposing, is you could measure it by accuracy of choice, and it could you could ask what's the efficient encoding rule to maximize the average financial payoff, for example. Um, from, from, from your choices, and so if the range of choices that you can encounter is different, the rule that will be optimal is going, you know, the, the encoding function is going to be a different encoding function. Um, now, in the literature, there is a variety of things that people assume about that, in particular because a lot of the efficient coding literature is in perceptual contexts where one is not incentivizing uh, the judgments and so then guesses about what it is that the, that the perceptual system of people is in fact optimizing is something that the, the researchers are freer to make, uh, to make alternative hypotheses about. I mean, I, I have been interested and I have papers about efficient coding in which, you know, what I like to assume is that it's the expected payoff to the subject in the experimental setting that's being maximized by the encoding system. But in the literature, that's not always what people assume. Yes. You would expect that if a subject's payoff is, say, expected as financial return, that the that the optimal coding would would, would not be uniform. That is, you would, it would make much it would be much more important to distinguish between big payoffs and and small payoffs. That's right. So you, sh you should. You, that's right. You, sh you should allow s more of mistakes that are not going to hurt you a lot, and for the sake of having few mistakes of the ones that would, and, that, and so that would be, uh, you know, that would be what I would say. At efficient coding, um, you know, theory should, in fact, when applied to economic decision problems, sh should be delivering. Um, okay. So I'm basically out of time. Uh, these slides will be posted. Uh, the, the last part of the slides discusses a fourth uh, possible difference, uh, which is that the noisy encoding hypothesis also has different implications than those of comparative comparison noise uh, for coordination problems. And so uh, basically, I'll just tell you what it's about. Um, it's about uh, observed behavior in coordination games where, given what the subjects are told about the payoffs, uh, there's a possibility of both coordinating on, say, a high action or both coordinating on, um, on a low action. And, uh, and so you could have multiple, multiple equilibria in the case that the subjects are making rational decisions on the basis of a correct understanding of the payoffs that they've been told about. And uh, probably many of you are familiar with the global games literature that argues that you can get instead a determinate prediction in those kinds of settings if you assume that people base their decisions not on precise awareness and, and perfect common knowledge among the players of what the payoffs are, but on the basis of a private signal about the relative payoffs that involves some small amount of noise in it. So I mean, that's a, that's a familiar argument. What I wanted to point out in the lecture is that that's an argument that is relying on the existence of what I'm calling early noise, noise in the recognition of what you are being told in the experiment the payoffs are, and not comparison noise. You can ask in that setup what would happen if you assume the only relevant noise is comparison noise, namely people are able to correctly evaluate uh, what they were told about the setup, and they correctly, as is assumed in the, uh, the literature on quantal response equilibria, you assume that their random choices are responding to a correct calculation of the expected payoffs from playing different things, given what the equilibrium probabilities of action of the other players are. You can introduce comparison noise, uh, as the quantal response equilibrium literature does, and in this case uh, of these coordination games, introducing a small amount of comparison noise does not get you away from the result that you have the large multiplicity of equilibria. Uh, 
whereas a small amount of early noise does break uh, the multiplicity of equilibria. And this is also, I think, um, uh, an, an interesting uh, difference, at least a reason to also be interested in uh, entertaining the hypothesis of encoding noise about what the data are. Now, in the lit is also a comment on the literature on global games. I mean, this. The mathematics of the result is well known to people who've looked at the papers in the literature on global games. The way it's often discussed in that literature, though, is it's treated as being a fact about the environment that people are not, in fact, able to see the data directly, and they only have private signals, and there's noise in their private signals. And if that's true, uh, that can break the multiplicity of equilibria. And people who think that that's what determines um, the answer to the question often say, well, if there's a public signal, then, you know, then the global games result doesn't apply. Um, if there's a public signal with, with, with sufficient precision, and that's because they're assuming that, of course, what is in your environment is correctly recognized, and you can make precise decisions on the basis of what's in your environment, and you're only basing your decision on a noisy signal if it's a fact about the environment that you can't see the true value, although you have some private signal which involves some noise. What I'm hypothesizing is that we should be interested in the hypothesis that even when stuff is right on the screen in front of you, the way you process it involves encoding it with noise or retrieving what has been encoded, uh, retrieving it with noise when you're, when you're taking that information to make decisions on the basis of it. And so that introduces the kind of noise that the global games literature hypothesized and called a noisy private signal. And I'm saying you should expect there to always be noisy private signals because the noise is in your processing of the information you were given. If that's the case, you should expect that there are only noisy private signals. There can be a public signal in the sense that somebody in the middle of town has a loudspeaker and they, they say very loudly something that everybody can hear, but it's still going to have to be processed by each of those individuals. And if you think it's natural that there is going to be noise in the way information is processed by each of us, then you should expect the case in which there are only noisy private signals to be the relevant case. Okay, I think I've. No, this 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 is just saying they they learn to play optimally given what they've got going on in their heads and. Right, but they also anticipate what other players do. Well, they're, they're, they they if you suppose at, with practice if you so if you suppose that with practice they learn to optimally respond to the people they're playing against. This is what the equilibrium should be like once people have learned enough uh, to be responding. Uh, responding well to the environment that they're in. So the theory would be relevant for that case as an outcome of learning. It wouldn't have to depend on anyone consciously understanding what the setup is. OK, I'm sorry I've, uh, I've run over time, but I hope that that overview of some reasons for being interested in uh, cognitive noise will at least intrigue uh, you to learn more about it. The slides have a bunch of references to papers where you can, uh, where you can learn more about these things. <laughs>